I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. If you have high quality product to be at the bar, it's like a weapon. It's not about the figures. It's about who those figures are. The Hospopreneurs Podcast. I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack it. With James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 77 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. Shaped by 16 years working with some of the largest alcohol distributors in the world, like Coca-Cola, Diageo, and Pernod Ricard, as a rep and brand ambassador, my guest today has come to be known colloquially as Whiskey Pete. After we met at a media event in 2018 at the Starwood Whiskey Distillery in Port Melbourne, Pete and I remained in contact and I came to understand just how much more lies behind the whiskey and cigars. Pete is an interesting and polarizing man. He's a whiskey consultant, event manager, and the only Cuban qualified master cigar roller outside of Cuba. With a head full of grey hair, he lied on his first CV and describes his business, Gentleman's Cabinet, as education meets inebriation. Pete is a fun guy and starts off with a great story that I'm not going to spoil. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show, Pete. Hey James, thanks for having me. Anytime, anytime. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm looking forward to getting into the interview today and it's been an exciting experience getting to know you since we met down at the Starwood Whiskey Distillery. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it as well. It'd be my honour. Mate, 100%. As you know, the first question I like to ask is what is your crazy hospitality story? (laughs) My crazy hospitality story, my goodness. Here's a cracker. Here's a good one for you. So obviously what I do is I teach people about whiskey and cigars and thoroughly enjoy it. And the ritual of whiskey and cigars is something that I feel like is getting some momentum. It was kind of a lost art form in a way. And uh, I suppose I've dedicated my life towards it. But here's a crazy hospitality story for you. So I once met a bloke by the name of Richard Patterson. He is the master distiller for Dalmore and for Jura and for White and Mackay. Now, I met this bloke and I had a pile of cigars in my pocket and we were out drinking together in London and we were drinking some Dalmore 18 and I was commenting on how amazingly the Dalmore whiskies go with cigars. So they're sweet and rich and chocolatey, similar sort of tasting notes as you described tobacco. And I came up with the suggestion that maybe he should do a whiskey that linked with cigars. And the cigars we were smoking at the time was the Partiga Series D number four. And then a year and a half later, I had a bottle arrive at my doorstep Wow. With a handwritten card from Richard Patterson, I should have grabbed it, saying, basically, this came from you, and thank you. The Dalmore Cigar Malt basically developed out of us drinking and smoking together, and we were smoking Partigas Series D number four, which is the number one selling Cuban cigar in the world, or at least it was at the time. And so then he went about creating a whiskey that completely linked and paired perfectly with the cigar we were smoking. So that's a pretty cool story, I reckon. That is definitely a cool story. Thank you for sharing that one. Amazing. That's probably not as crazy as some of the others, but it's still... Still good fun. Yeah, we've had some crazy stories, but I do really like that one. Everyone is unique. Everyone is interesting. They're all exciting. Thank you for sharing that one. Most welcome. Pete, I'd like to know why you do what you do. Why I do what I do. So I worked for booze companies for a long time, 10, 10 and a half years, something like that. And the only thing I really thoroughly enjoyed about my job was teaching people about booze essentially and that wasn't always a huge component when you're working on the road as a sales rep and that kind of thing you don't get to do as much as I would like and the thing about booze and cigars for me whiskey and cigars is counseling for men or women I suppose it's about taking an hour and a half or two hours out of our busy lives and really sitting down and connecting with each other as individuals like it's so much more than when you throw down a bottle of whiskey and hand a cigar to a mate it's more than the financial commitment it's committing to here's an hour and a half two hours of my time let's really connect and explore and check in on each other it's something magical that happens in those moments which you can't get it from a 15 minute coffee Mm. and throughout my time working for liquor companies. I had a pile of friends where they come into hardship and I basically I'd follow the same theory where we sit down, throw them a cigar, throw down a bottle of whiskey and it wouldn't matter if we spoke about what their hardships were or what they were going through or if we were just shooting the shit about everything except sports because it's not really my strong point. And I could see the impact that that was having on my friends' lives, actually taking some time to reinvest in your friendships. And I felt like I could be doing more for people than what I was doing traveling around and slinging cases of booze. Mm. Liquor companies weren't really excited about being involved with tobacco, as you could imagine. 
so I figured if I was going to do this, I may as well go out and do it on my own. And I kind of took the idea of being a brand ambassador and privatized it. So now we do corporate events and bucks parties and whiskey and cigar bars for weddings. We even do some cigar rolling as well. I went to Cuba and learned how to do that. If with hand rolling Cuban cigars, you've got a title. Master Cigar Roller. Yes. The only Cuban qualified master cigar roller in Australia. Because yes. Do more of what you love. So my theory with life is work out what you love, work out what makes you come alive and find a way to share it with people and make a buck out of it so you can keep sharing. Yes. And so sort of the original aim behind Gentleman's Cabinet was sharing the skills and the knowledge around whiskey and cigars so that way we could create those moments with other people's friendship groups so if i share the knowledge and the wisdom and help people understand what style of whiskey they like and why or what sort of cigars they like and why then hopefully i'll be able to take it out to the masses and they're going to create those moments in their lives and from that why then you've been doing that that's what you've been doing that's what we do five and a half years So Pete, with that why, how do you actually execute that through the gentleman's cabinet? So my personal why was one, make no mistake. I like drinking and smoking and I wanted to do more of that. (laughs) Make no mistake. My other why was about helping people and creating those moments where people will take time out of their busy schedule and actually hang out and shoot the shit. And it was about sharing the skill set behind appreciating whiskey and cigars so that way people can create those moments. A wise man once said to me a very long time ago, a whiskey enthusiast, he said, the best whiskey is the one you don't think about whilst you're drinking it. But that took ages to resonate and really grow and morph and flourish in my understanding of whiskey because when you come from a liquor background, you know, what you're drinking and why it tastes that way and how it came to taste that way is what we're all about. But I think the older I become and the more experience that I gather, I realize that, as he said, it's actually completely true. It's whiskey, whilst it's a shitload of fun and super delicious, it's what it's the catalyst for. And the same with cigars as well. It's about creating those moments where you share with people. Whiskey tastes better when you share it. Cigars taste better when you share them. And it's by understanding what you like and why you like it, it takes that extra part of the out of the equation so you can focus on the connection with the other individuals that you're hanging out with. How do you create an environment where people are open enough to be sharing really personal things with each other? How do you do it through a business? For us, it's all educationally focused. So our little anthem is where education meets inebriation. So one is the catalyst for the other and none of our events are 100% educational or none of them are 100% entertainment. It's a combination of the two. So it's about capturing the hearts and minds of a group for two, two and a half hours by the time we have a couple of beers afterwards and talk about experiences and that kind of thing or compare notes on the whiskies that we like. And it's combining the knowledge and the passion, but also telling a few stories about how it's positively impacted my life and what it's given and contributed to my friendship group. And further abroad than that, it generally peaks an interest in people because we live such busy lives. There's something magical about whiskey and cigars that a 15 minute coffee will never achieve. You know, you go in, you talk about how work's going, how wife and kids are going and how your mortgage repayments are going. And then you bail out and you go on with your day. But when you sit down and you really take that time to stop and smell the whiskey, it creates that special moment of connection. So for us, it's about sharing education and also identifying how important creating those moments are with the hope that our clients will go out and then sew that into their own life. Pete, I'd like to ask you a controversial question. It's come up a few times over the course of the program, and I know that you're the man to ask controversial questions to. Yeah, okay. (laughs) What's your perspective on traditional versus new age aging methods for whiskey? Ah, great question. I'm all for innovation. I understand the heritage of where it's come from and 18 years being a great age for whiskey and that kind of thing, but I feel like a lot of people haven't really considered the limitations of committing to age statements. One from a consumer price point perspective, and the other is from what you can actually achieve out of your whiskey. Because it's one thing to be an 18 year old lowland Scottish whiskey, which has lots of temperature differential comparative to right up in the north where it's just super cold the whole time. And the way the whiskey ages is I like to describe a cask or a barrel 
as like a lung. It's a living, breathing thing. So they char the inside, puts that charcoal layer, either char level one, two, three, four. It's very technical. One being lightly toasted, four being cooked the fuck out of it, as I affectionately refer to it. As that barrel heats up, it expands and sucks the whiskey through the charcoal into the wood and it grabs some of those wood sugars and caramelized whatever's been in there beforehand. And as it cools, it squeezes it back in. Now, the more frequently that process happens, the quicker the whiskey matures. So one of the brands that I brought to Australia was Old Pulteney, and it had a 17-year-old Old Pulteney, super delicious, kind of sweet and salty, but the colour on it was super, super light, like lighter than most other five- or six-year-old whiskies that you get around the world because it's from a place in Scotland called Wick, and it's just super bloody fucking cold the whole time. Whereas if you've got a Lowlands whisky, which has a much more temperature differential, it's going to age a lot quicker. So I feel like... Age statements are a limiting component to whiskey and by breaking down some of those barriers into some of these newer aging methods or multiple cast add density or complexity of flavor i feel like we're barking up the right tree but i feel like it's a work in progress i don't feel like we're quite there yet so what about things like using wood chips or just aging differently using different techniques to age instead of using a barrel yeah so my theory is if it tastes good and it makes our booze cheaper i'm all for it Great. If it tastes rubbish, then what's the point? I'm open to breaking down the barriers on this. I'm not a purist as such. As I said, I just like drinking and smoking. So if I can get great tasting booze for a cheaper price or a more sustainable source of whiskey, then I'm all for it. Almost all of these newer methods claim to be more environmentally friendly, sustainable, etc. So they seem to make a pretty strong argument against the traditionalist view. So I was interested to hear your perspective on that one. I'd like to know what you're learning about, Pete. What is it that you're learning about right now? What am I learning about right now? I'm learning about a few things right now. I think it's really important being involved in the industry to keep growing, learning and evolving because things change and you need to keep ahead of the game. And also now not working for boost companies, I've got to source that kind of information and education myself. It's not what they send down from a marketing team to tell us how good Johnny Walker is and all the reasons why. Now it's, okay, Pete, well, what are you interested in and where are you running? So a couple of the things I've been learning about are Sherry Cars and how to source them and from the new age kind of thing how to potentially age the sherry into the cask in a quicker format sherry cask is super expensive compared to american oak because of supply and demand so i've been doing a lot of research and maybe a little bit of trial and error around how to get the sherry into the wood and make it taste like a cask that's had sherry floating in it for a hundred years so that's been really interesting i've also been brushing up on tobacco varietals and different flavor profiles that come from each or what purpose they serve in a cigar. So whether it's a structure leaf, whether it's an aromatic leaf or whether it's a flavor leaf, the structure prevents the ash falling off too quickly. So getting a greater knowledge and understanding and how climatic conditions affect the flavor. So if you grow a golden Virginia in one area and one temperature, how does that affect flavor compared to a colder climate and that kind of thing. I've also been putting a fair bit of time into understanding some of those lesser known whiskies coming out of Europe because there's quite a few little distilleries coming along in Sweden and Germany and Denmark and just trying to get my head around what's going on there and if it is the new thing or if it's a flash in a pan. Fantastic. What innovations or innovative techniques have you seen in the industry? You've spent a long time in the booze industry. What have you seen happen in your time in it? Plenty. I ran my first masterclass when I was 19. I started attending masterclasses from 16 because I got really interested in it. And the way my mind works is if I'm interested in something, I need to know everything about it. One of the biggest changes I've seen is the demographic of consumers. So at 19 through to probably 22, 23, most of the attendees I'd have at masterclass would be 55 plus and this young kid that was prematurely graying wandering in trying to teach them how to drink whiskey and what's going on and there's always the assumption that they know more based on experience and age and probably consumption of liters drunk and then uh, all of a sudden, I got interested in whiskey and sort of five, six years later, it became cool. When I started Gentleman's Cabinet, I used to buy a bottle of Yamazaki 12 for 65 bucks a bottle. Now it's 250 to 300 if you can find it. So there's been a massive rush from a global scale to whiskey. So one is the consumer base has definitely, definitely grown, but also the shift from regular blended whiskeys or less premium blended whiskeys into premium blends and single malts has been a massive, massive 
these things. And when you think about a bottle of booze has 20, 26, 50, I think, tax on it, give or take, depending on percentage. Don't quote me 100%. Think about a bottle of Jim Beam White, right? So they produce a bottle of Jim Beam White. They age it for four years because it's a Kentucky straight bourbon. They ship it all the way to Australia. It sits in a warehouse. Then it goes to a liquor wholesaler, then goes to a bottle shop. And six weeks later, with a bit of luck, the booze company gets paid. The kind of money that you're returning on a bottle of Jim Beam White is lucky to be two or three bucks by the time you include all the expenses that went into it. Whereas if you can trade people up into those whiskeys at say 50, 60, 70 dollars or more, that's where the real margin's coming in. And it means booze companies are able to do a lot more to connect with their consumers and engage them. And I've also seen it from an event perspective as well, because the market's worth so many more dollars, we're still selling basically the same amount of whiskey. We're just selling more expensive whiskey. So it means there's a lot more coming through from an education perspective, from an innovation perspective, and from a marketing perspective. What changes would you like to see take place in the industry? More cowboy hats. Yeah? Definitely. Get everyone in a cowboy hat. (laughs) Yeah, I'm open to sharing. That's a really interesting question. What would I like to see happen? I think from a bartender or an on-premise perspective, I've definitely seen people's people's as in bartenders knowledge grow. I think creating more opportunities where they can share that education with their customers. And I know it's hard when you're 10 deep on a Friday night, but creating those moments and people challenging themselves to share that knowledge, which also reinforces their own awareness of the knowledge. So I think people realizing that you don't have to know everything about it to share a little bit of information. One, it creates value for your customers, right? If you go in and you're dropping $20 on a nip of whiskey and you teach them a bit about it, there's every likelihood they're going to show up the next week with a couple of mates from work and talk about the one that they just had and then sit down for some more education. So from a value Mm -hmm. perspective, it keeps customers coming back, but also there's only so much that 15 Australian whiskey ambassadors can do. So it's about sharing that message and slowly educating the market so they understand what they're buying and why. Because we've all got a story where we've gone and bought something that we hated. For me, it was a Lefroy 18 year old when I was, I think, 18. And it was way too advanced for where I was at. Now I absolutely adore it. So understanding which whiskey is right for each occasion and what your flavor profile enjoys and understands, and then taking yourself on that journey. There are a couple of things there that resonate with me. And one is that in telling that story, especially having been a bartender, telling that story, I think is if you come up with your own stories to connect with a brand, connect with a label, connect with a distillery, connect with those people involved. And so sharing that story in the process of educating a guest is really magical. And then when you can see people hanging on to every word, when you're telling them this great story about this distillery you went to and, you know, the old guy who sweeps up at the end of the day, you know, his family's doing this and you met his kids and like, it's this amazing experience to be part of that. So that totally resonates. It is all about the story that you share. Totally. And that's the difference to be able to, you know, cop a five, 10, $20 tip. Like there is actually a return on investment there. And even what an opportunity to work on your own presentation skills and for a guest to leave a place with a smile, that's proper hospitality, right? It's one thing to pour a great beer and get a solid head on it or make the perfect mojito. But, you know, everyone drinks beer and most people drink mojitos as well. It's about that impact that you have on the individual in the moment. And that's the reason they'll come back to your bar. Absolutely. How do you develop new ideas? How do you come up with new concepts and new ideas? Alcohol and cigars. (laughs) No, so my mind's sort of quite often running overdrive when I've got those downtimes to innovate, to listen to feedback from my customers as well. So for example, the cigar rolling thing, I'd never really thought about it until I started getting phone calls for people that wanted to do cigar rolling events. And Australia wasn't approving visas for Cubans to come and roll cigars because they saw it as promotion of tobacco. So I thought, well, bugger it. I'll jump on an airplane and I'll go over and learn how to do it myself and then do it over here. I think listening to feedback and observing changes and trends in the market. So one of the things we've added in the last 12 months is gin masterclasses or gin sensory sessions where we'll have the gin and a pilot 
color the botanicals from the gin smattered around or a pile of different gins. And then we talk to them about, I don't think the appropriate term is mash bill, but that's what we call it in whiskey. So the blend of botanicals that go into making your gin and then how to select a tonic that goes along with that and then how to pick a garnish that's going to work well with the botanical makeup in your gin. Because gin's a growing category and we were getting phone calls about it, we listen, we adapt and we move forward. And we've definitely got a lot of growth coming out of innovation. Yes. That there, at the very start of that question, jokingly, you're like with whiskey and cigars, but I can see and hear a tool for you to be able to access that sort of creative thinking. Totally. It's obviously an important part of your life and your own personal development, your Mm. own personal journey. So it's interesting to hear that those are the tools that you use to access that sort of mentality because it's not uncommon. When you're sitting down alone with a glass of whiskey or a tea or a coffee or just a cigar or whatever it is that you sit down with to get into that reflective point of solitude, that is a magical place to be. And some people use those sorts of tools to access that way of thinking. And it's interesting to hear that's what you're doing. So yeah, in a way, they're almost meditative. For me, the two together, it's about taking that hour out of life and life is damn busy. My life is super busy and I don't have kids and I can only imagine how tough it must be once you do. But for me, it's taking that time out and taking those moments for yourself. It's meditation. But also there's a chemical reason as to why that works. So tobacco was popularized. It was originally consumed what they call mapacho, which is also known as Aztec tobacco. The Aztec priests used to smoke this mapacho, which has nine times the nicotine of regular tobacco, and they'd smoke it. And what they found is they'd think loftier thoughts and they felt more connected to the gods. And the chemical reason for that is one of the gases that comes off from tobacco helps the connective tissue between the left and right hemisphere of your brain. So one side's logic and one side's creativity. Don't ask me which one. But by smoking tobacco, especially non-cigarette tobacco, which has 48 added chemicals to make them burn slower and more evenly and not go out and that kind of thing, but proper tobacco, by ingesting some of the gases that it gives off, it helps the connective tissue so you can have those loftier thoughts where creativity Activity and logic flesh out and come together. So that's why it's a big part of the reason it's been so instrumental in both my brainstorming and my success. Love that. When we talk about success, so this is the quote that got me through a lot of the slower times or the tougher times. And it was a Bob Dylan quote. And who else would you take life advice from? And I paraphrased slightly, but it was something along the lines of this. A successful man is a man that wakes up every morning and goes to bed every night and in between time does whatever he wants. And for me, sometimes cash flow is amazing and sometimes it's absolutely terrible. But I wake up every morning and I go to bed every night and other than email, and quotes, I do exactly what I want. And my measure for that is if I wake up with a smile 85% of the time, I'm on the right track, I'm doing the right thing. If it's anything less than that, something needs to change. And that's from a business perspective and from a personal perspective, because working in liquor, working the kind of hours that we all do and juggling life in between time, it's very easy to let it get on top of you. And if you're not vigilant and staying on top of your own happiness, then it can pull you down. Mm. So I think taking that time to reflect and look inwards to make sure you're on the right path has definitely been really instrumental in keeping Gentleman's Cabinet afloat, but also keeping my passion for the project. Yes. Who inspired you? That's interesting. I couldn't say it's a personal acquaintance or anyone that I've known, but at the point where I was debating what to do with my life, I quit my job at Perno and um, basically spent three weeks getting really fucked up, drinking a lot, smoking a lot and partying and that kind of thing. And one morning at 11 a.m. after not being to bed the night before, I was sitting in my hot tub sort of fiddling away on YouTube and I came across a clip from a, I believe he's an Oxford professor through the 70s and 80s and 90s and his name was Alan Watts, Sir Alan Watts, I think. And he had a clip on there, it was just a audio clip and it was entitled, what would you do if money was no object? And it basically spoke about how we're educated and encouraged from a young age to take a career which basically will get us the most money based on whatever skill set we have. So if you're intelligent enough to be a doctor or lawyer, go do that and make lots of money and then get married, have a few babies, eventually pay off a mortgage and then retire and hope you have enough cash for retirement. And I know that kind of ideology came down from my 
folks as well. They were about work hard, save a lot and keep rolling. But I could see how miserable they were. And they're going to love it when they hear this, how miserable they were for 40 years worth of working. And life seemed too short to be unhappy for 20, 30, 40 years. So it really encouraged me to chase down what it was that actually made me come alive. And I feel like there's nothing that makes me come more alive than when I'm talking about booze or smoking a cigar or just spending time with friends and creating those moments. So that's why I'm here. Absolutely. What is your biggest challenge right now? Ooh, biggest challenge right now, technology. <laughs> so we're doing a pile of work with website and a couple of other educational tools that we're going to be rolling out. That's mostly just because it's not my strong point. My strong point is drinking and smoking and wearing cowboy hats. Although some would debate the cowboy hat, whether it's my strong point <laughs> or not. But I think when you own and run and manage your own business, it's impossible to be good at every facet of what you do. So one of the things we started with solely me running the show for quite a few years, and it's acknowledging and understanding that my capability is in certain places and others it is not. So it's about finding the most capable people in whatever it is you're trying to achieve for your business and bringing them in, whether it's as a contractor, whether it's as a consultant, or whether it's as a full-time employee. So for me, it's been about letting go of managing everything day to day and bringing the people in that I know will do it better, which is also much easier once you've got some cash flow coming through as well. So definitely it would have made a difference if I did it three years ago, but there's no way I could have afforded it. So it's about understanding where your opportunities are and then finding someone that does a better job. Yes. Obviously, if you don't have the budget for it, then there are still ways to do that through sweat equity and those sorts of other avenues to excite people to get behind a cause. And it's really a sales process to do that, to sell it to anyone. Having such an experience or background in sales, have you found that that has been able to hold you in good stead or has it influenced any decisions that you've made in your career? That's a great question. So here's my take on that. Every business full stop, plain and simple, is a sales business, right? Because if you're not selling whatever it is you're selling, then there's no cash flow coming through, which means you have no business. It doesn't really matter what your product is. It's still a sales business. You could be a house cleaning service and that's still about sales because if you're not selling to your customers and you're not keeping the leads coming through and you're not maintaining those customers, then you're back at square one, right? So having the sales ability probably was a real catalyst in making me brave enough to jump out and do this. So yeah, 100%. And that's one of the things I always found really intriguing about bartenders is you meet someone that has just started in their first bar role and they're quite shy and timid and that kind of thing. And then you'd run into them at the same bar six or 12 months later and all of a sudden they have this really highly developed social skill set and they're super comfortable in that environment. I remember when I started, on the phones, I was quite shy and couldn't string together three minutes worth of phone conversation, which is what they encouraged us to do. And then even kicking off as a sales rep, going in and meeting a customer for the first time and saying, hey, I'm Pete from Coca-Cola. I want you to buy my shit. Or, you know, this is how my products can help you make more money from your business and all the spiel they go on with. Originally, I was quite a shy guy, but it was about sucking it up and pushing forward and really developing those interpersonal skills. And we can call it sales ability, but sales ability for me, is just being real and not being selfish. If you go in and obviously you've got an objective to sell whatever your product is, but you go in and you identify where the opportunity is with the customer and how your product is going to fill that need, and they may not even know what the need is. If you're worried about what you can give to your customers first and then take profit second, that's always stood me in good stead. Yes. Pete, I'd like to know, we're originally in the episode, I'd like to know who you'd like to hear on the show. Who I'd like to hear on the show? That's a great one. I think, we should be doing a lot more obviously spirits and whiskey is my focus but I think there's a lot going on in Australian distillation at the moment and I think it's really really exciting by the end of next year I believe we're on track to have more single malt distilleries in Scotland don't quote me on that but I think we're getting up there that's big it's massive like the volume they're putting out is nowhere near, but I think awareness of the Australian spirit category. So when I started in booze, Aussie spirits meant Bundaberg rum or any of those really dodgy vodkas that you buy two for 30 bucks at your local bottle shop. But I think acknowledging where our booze is coming from and how it's really going to put us on the world map and get us a pile of respect, but also just awareness on what's going on down under. I think that's a really, really exciting opportunity and an exciting time to be part of booze. So I think if we're getting these distillers in or the owners of the 
brands and talking about why and how and then what their objectives are in the future. I feel like we can all band together as one big Australian team, basically take it to the world, stick that little golden kangaroo on the back and make an impact. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today, Pete. It's been amazing having you on. Thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. I love what you do. Thanks, mate. It's been my honor. The show today was produced by the in-house audio team at Hospopreneurs, led by Jake Olver. Voiceovers were by Angus Brennan. To learn more, head to hospopreneurs.com.